13 underrated sinister and perverse exorcism and possession horror movies that will fuel nightmares for days. The first chillers of Hollywood came in the form of Rosemary's Baby in 1968 and The Exorcist in 1973. But since then, haven't we all just developed a taste for movies that revolve around exorcism and possession? If we come to think of it, the reason is quite simple. These films don't just give you a terrible antagonist in the form of a demonic or paranormal entity, but also present us with the idea that God exists. Our contemporary society very much accepts God and the spiritual elements. And even though we might not be religious, we do have faith. These films target and conjure that very faith, and give us hope that all is not lost. Naturally, if we accept that God and his angels exist, we will have to accept that the devil and his demons exist. Exorcism and possession films appeal to our intricate beliefs. And that's the reason why we shell out money from our pockets to get scared. But at the same time, we try to find the silver lining behind the darkest of demonic clouds. Let's explore 13 forgotten films of this genre that deserve to be digged out of the sands of time. Before we get into the explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but means a lot to us. Thank you, let's begin. The Exorcist 3. In the first film, Reagan McNeil was possessed by the powerful demon Pazuzu, and Father Damien Karras lost his life in an attempt to save Reagan. This film opens in 1990, several years after those horrific events, with Father Dyer and Lieutenant William F. Kinderman remembering Father Karras. However, strange things have started happening again. The crucifix in one of the churches strangely comes to life. While many people are committing murders following the modus operandi of a serial killer named the Gemini Killer, who was executed in 1975, Lieutenant Kinderman's investigation takes him to the head of a psychiatric hospital, Dr. Temple, who tells Kinderman that one of his patients became suddenly violent and started claiming that he was the Gemini Killer. He says he's the Gemini Killer. To Kinderman's surprise, this patient was Father Damien Karras, who was now possessed by the ghost of the Gemini Killer. But that's not all, because Pazuzu is exacting revenge for being exorcised by Karras 15 years ago, and is now using Karras' body as a conduit for the Gemini Killer. Will Karras be able to overpower Pazuzu once again? Writer and director William Peter Blatley depicted the Gemini Killer on the lines of the infamous Zodiac Killer. It is believed by many that the Zodiac Killer was heavily impressed by the 1973 film The Exorcist. Naturally, the film works wonders in terms of giving you frights and chills. Despite lacking projectile vomit and masturbation using a cross, Jason Miller effectively brings back the grim and evil tone that was set by the first entry, making Exorcist 3 a haunting chiller the horrors of which will remain with you long after the credits have rolled. The film doesn't do as well as the original, but works fine as a sequel. And it's no surprise because director Peter Blatley is also the writer of the original Exorcist novel. Prince of Darkness, 1987. The Brotherhood of Sleep is an old order in the basement of a Los Angeles monastery. The members of the Brotherhood communicate through dreams. And they find a green sentient liquid they don't fully understand. The head priest takes help from 13 academics to understand the nature of the liquid. The academics decipher the text around it and conclude that it is a corporeal embodiment of Satan in liquid form. One of the academics, quantum physicist Howard Byrick, tells the group that Satan is the son of a more powerful and dark entity only known as anti-god, who's trapped in the realm 
of antimatter. Meanwhile, the sentient liquid starts to break itself loose and possesses the people studying it. The survivors will have to stop the events, or else the anti-god will walk the face of Earth. Prince of Darkness follows in the same fashion as previous John Carpenter films and includes themes of claustrophobia and eternal doom. Apart from directing it, John Carpenter wrote the film and brilliantly merged physics and horror to give us a genre-blending film that can only be explained as a science fiction horror. Certain scenes, like the transformation of Kelly into a gruesomely disfigured being, have the potential to frighten even the bravest of horror fans. Carpenter also played intelligently with the dream sequences in the climax. Donald Pleasance as the priest, Victor Wong as Professor Howard Byrick, Susan Blanchard as Kelly, and Lisa Blount as Kathleen Danford give better performances than the others. But the characters themselves were rather hollow. Having said that, Prince of Darkness is a well-written movie that's simultaneously haunting, sarcastic, and humorous. Witchboard, 1986. Linda Brewster, her ex-boyfriend Brendan Sinclair, and her present boyfriend Jim Mora use a Ouija board to summon a spirit named David. But Jim insults David, and the spirit leaves only to slash the tires of Brandon's car. The next day, Linda finds the Ouija board and uses it again to summon David, eventually becoming addicted to the board. David, do you remember me? In reality, she is being subjected to progressive entrapment, which is a process by which a paranormal entity constantly terrorizes the user of the board to such an extent that they become weak and vulnerable to possession. Brandon seeks the help of a psychic medium named Zarabeth Crawford, but the evil entity won't let anyone come between it and Linda. However, is David the cause behind the sorry state of Linda? Or is there something else making the moves? Despite being a horror film, Witchboard is essentially a character-driven film. Todd Allen as Jim Mora, Tawny Kitten as Linda Brewster, and Stephen Nichols as Brendan Sinclair are all extremely relatable characters. It's horrifying not only because of the scary ghost and the efficient special effects, but also because it shows how a bromance between Jim and Brandon was affected because of Linda. This is the first directorial effort of Kevin S. Tenney, but Tenney showed craftsmanship through some really efficient camera work. Linda's possession is slow and gradual, but Tenney ensured that the viewers did not get bored and are able to feel the trauma and fright that she was feeling. Clearly, it's not the most original plot, and the 80s was a period filled with flicks about ghost haunting pretty damsels. But the efficient direction, screenplay, and acting made Witchboard a fresh experience for moviegoers of the 80s. The film went on to become a cult classic, and two unrelated sequels were produced in 1993 and 1995. The Devil's Candy, 2015. In a small house in rural Texas, Ray Smiley starts playing his guitar after hearing an ominous sound. When stopped by his mother, he tells her that he plays the guitar to avoid listening to the devil's voice. Ray continues hearing the devil, kills his mother and flees. Later, the Hellman family, consisting of Jesse, his wife, and little daughter Zoe, buys Ray's house and starts to live there. Jesse was an aspiring painter with no luck, but soon he starts hearing the same voice that Ray uses as inspiration. He paints grotesque murals with distorted faces of children being devoured by a demonic entity. Meanwhile, Ray has been abducting young kids. Only, 
to mutilate them and bury the corpses in suitcases. Jesse tells his wife about the voices that he's been hearing and hints that he's been possessed. But this is not the only problem for the Hellman family, as Ray is planning to get a hold of young Zoe Hellman. No, 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 you can't be loud. The Devil's Candy is a prime and critically acclaimed example of metal exploitation film in which heavy metal and horror form an unholy union. Writer and director Sean Brine crafted the characters of Jesse and Ray in an intelligent fashion. <laughs> While both of them seem to be possessed by the ominous voice of the devil, they take very different courses of action. While Ethan Embry's Jesse struggles to understand himself, Pruitt Taylor Vince's Ray gives himself up without struggling to become the devil's minion. The Devil's Candy uses loads of bloody motifs, but the film itself is not as violent. And what it does best is that it suggests horrific acts to the viewers and leaves the rest to their own imagination. It's a finely made film that's haunting, thrilling, suspenseful, and has the capability of scaring the young and old alike. You okay? The Last Exorcism, 2010. After Reverend Cotton Marcus lost his faith, he resorted to deceiving people by performing fake exorcisms in order to one day get the act delegitimized. He believes that possessions are nothing but a mental disorder, and the act of exorcism seemingly gives patients the perception that they've been freed from evil entities. To prove this use of deception as a means to cure psychological problems, he travels with filmmakers Iris and Daniel, who shoot the fake exorcism. One day, he is called for help by a farmer named Lewis, who believes that the devil has possessed his daughter, Nell. Reverend Marcus performs his fake exorcism and believing he has cured Nell of her mental disease. Later that night though, a visibly diseased Nell visits Marcus at his motel. The hospital says that she's physically fit, but Nell has found herself to be pregnant. On further investigation, disturbing facts about Nell surface. Reverend Marcus must summon his true faith in order to perform a real exorcism, or else the lives of many will be in danger. As a documentary style film, The Last Exorcism doesn't carry the same tension built by Blair Witch Project, nor does it have enough jump scare moments like the paranormal activities. However, it does make the viewer constantly wonder if there's actually anything paranormal or supernatural. It constantly plays with the audience's mind by making them switch sides. At one moment, you believe in the reasonable explanations given by Marcus. But a few seconds later, you find yourself hoping that Marcus gets his faith back. Director Daniel Stam put in a lot of effort to string together faith, folklore, and female puberty. Despite earning around $68 million and later getting a sequel, the film feels better in parts, but doesn't impress as a whole. Not if I can help it. The Covent, 2000. Many years ago, a young girl named Christine systematically killed every nun of a Covent and burnt the place to the ground. Naturally, she was put in a mental institution Years later, the Covent has become a place for young college students to vandalize, smoke pot, and sometimes have sex. While seeking a stash of drugs, a girl named Mo is overpowered by a group of Satanists who intend to sacrifice her. But Mo gets possessed by a demon who was already lurking in the infamous Abbey. Meanwhile, the Satanist also abduct a young virgin boy named Brant to further a nefarious plan. The only one who can save the day is Christine, who has now grown into an adult, though she continues to harbor her dark past. Directed by Mike Mendez, this comedy horror takes influence from both Evil Dead and Lumberto Brava's film Demons. 
It's a decent horror flick and contains enough scenes to make your gut churn with fear and stomach pain with laughter. But that's about it. There's no real message in the film, and honestly, one shouldn't look for one. The special effects could have been better, but the strong violence and gore make up for it. Scenes where the cultists stab one of the characters and the rampage that follows are beautifully filmed and incite some real fear. But then, the humor element comes in and relieves you, and the entire motion picture feels like a roller coaster ride of humor and horror. Session 9, 2001. Gordon runs an asbestos abatement company in Massachusetts, and, desperate for money, makes a bid to remove the asbestos of an abandoned psychiatric hospital within two weeks. As his crew starts working at the asylum, Mike comes across a set of nine audio tapes of sessions with a former patient named Mary Hobbs. Mary had split personality disorder, and she committed horrific, cold-blooded crimes. Who am I speaking with? Mary got a china doll from her mommy. As time goes by, the crew experiences strange events, and the horrors of Mary's crimes seem to resurface once again. The tape from the ninth session plays at the end of the film. In that recording, the doctor asks one of Mary's personalities where it lives, to which she replies, I live in the weak and the wounded dark. Although the film didn't do well in the box office, it is often said to be inspired by Stanley Kubrick's 1980 masterpiece, The Shining. Like The Last Exorcism, Session 9 also confuses the audience as it blurs the fine line between a mental disorder and demonic possession. The shocking ending might not be as surprising to an ardent horror hound, but co-writer and director Brad Anderson knows how to generate suspense and thrills. Anderson brought an essence of realism by shooting the film in Danvers State Mental Hospital of Massachusetts. However, due credit must be given to the performances of Peter Mullen as Gordon Fleming and Josh Lucas as Hank. Despite having underwritten characters, they managed to keep the film above average on the acting front. Session 9 was given moderately positive reviews, but many consider it to be a cult classic. Let us know in the comments if you think that's true. Shock 1977 After a drug-addicted and abusive man named Carlo committed suicide, his wife Dora was in a sanatorium for almost a year. Following her release, she started living with her present husband, Bruno, and agrees to move into her old house despite it being filled with Carlo's memories. As the days pass, Dora starts to notice strange events in the house, but Bruno thinks she's just having another breakdown and begs her to calm down. Things reach the epitome when Carlo's ghost possesses her son, Marco. It seems that Carlo's ghost is seeking revenge for a deed committed against him in the past. Shock is a film that fails to decide if it wants to be a psychological horror or a supernatural thriller. So, it ultimately ends up being a mix of both, which is the beauty of the film. There's a ghostly presence, but at no point in time do we learn whether it is paranormal or just the character's imagination. Brava has brought out the sinister in Marco, the character which David Collin Jr. plays. Although, the show is stolen by the beautiful acting of Dora's performer, Daria Nicolodia. The storyline might be unoriginal, but Bava knows where to place the camera and how to direct a horror film. Shock is the last theatrical release of the legendary Italian horror director. His son Lumberto Bava directed a great chunk of the movie because of Elder Bava's poor health. But Lumberto remains uncredited. Due to this, we see elements of both the father and the son in the film. This gives Shock a unique place in its theme and substance and successfully makes your time worthwhile. Daniel Isn't Real 2019 
A young, shy, and troubled kid named Luke witnesses the aftermath of a mass shooting at a coffee shop. The incident shocks him, but he comes across a confident and charming boy named Daniel, who was one of the onlookers. Daniel and Luke soon become close friends and spend time playing together. Luke doesn't realize that Daniel is just his imaginary friend until he drinks his mother's entire bottle of psychiatric medication just because Daniel told him that it would give him superpowers. superpowers. After this incident, Luke's mother Claire made Luke symbolically banish Daniel in a dollhouse. Years later, Luke once again finds himself burdened by emotional trouble due to his vague future his social life, and his mother's mild schizophrenia. Luke visits his psychiatrist, but this doesn't seem to help, and he resorts to reopening the dollhouse and summoning Daniel once again. However, Daniel has now grown up and is of Luke's age. Naturally, he is more powerful and authoritative. Luke will now realize the reality about Daniel, but putting him back is not going to be an easy task. Miles Robbins as Luke Nightingale and Patrick Schwarzenegger as Daniel have given tremendous performances. But there are other great aspects like the screenplay and gripping cinematography that make the film worthwhile. Daniel Isn't Real causes viewers to see and feel the helplessness that Luke experiences. As a possession film, director Adam Egypt Mortimer seems to blur the line between imaginary friend and a demonic entity. Despite these positive points, Mortimer could have improved the film by giving Sasha Lane and Hannah Marks more screen time. Vater unser im Himmel. Yeah. Requiem, 2006. A young and religious Michaela starts going to university in Germany. She has had a history of epilepsy, though medication has improved her condition. The first visit home for Christmas elates the young girl. However, as she spends time there, the epileptic episodes come back to her. But this time, she believes that several paranormal entities possess her. Michaela soon refuses all scientific medication and insists on taking religious and spiritual help only. The story is based on the true events from the life of Elise McKell, who died at the age of 23 on July 1st, 1976 in Bavaria, West Germany. The psychiatric clinic of Wurzburg diagnosed her with epilepsy and later depression and suicidal thoughts began clouding her mind. She would be administered various drugs for her seizure and deteriorating psychological state. But when all efforts seemed to go in vain, her parents resorted strictly to religion and exorcism by Father Arnold Renz and Pastor Ernst Alt. The two of them carried out 67 exorcisms over a period of 10 months, with a few lasting for over four hours. Gradually, Annalise's condition would worsen, and she would see demons in the faces of people around her. Eventually, Annalise would stop eating and drinking as she thought starving would dispel the evils from her body. This led to an acerbation of her health, and she weighed only 68 pounds before she died. The court, however, found Annalise's parents and two priests guilty of negligent homicide and sentenced them to six months in prison. Some argue that her condition was a case of paranoid schizophrenia, which led her to believe that she was possessed, and each repetitive exorcism reinforced her beliefs. However, her resolve to not consume food for such prolonged periods of time raises questions about the rational explanation. According to Anna Michelle, her daughter sacrificed herself for the atonement of others. The 2005 film The Exorcism of Emily Rose is based on the same story. Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist, 2005. Father Lancaster Mirren was forced to participate in the arbitrary execution of several parishioners by the Nazis during World War II. The experience made Mirren question his own faith and he chose to devote his life to archaeology. In 1947, he started to oversee the digging of the Byzantine church built around the 5th century in British Kenya. Strangely, the church appears intact as if it was buried right after its construction. As Mirren and his colleagues enter it, 
they find that it was actually built on a temple where human sacrifice was performed. Father Mirren befriends a physically deformed young boy named Chech, whom the villagers think was cursed. Chech becomes the obvious victim of an ancient demon that Father Marin unknowingly released on Earth. He will have to find his faith back if he intends to save the young boy. The film story is exceptionally well written, and it seeks to expand the lore that was set by the first Exorcist film. That being said, Dominion received largely average reviews because it was released at an age when people stopped caring about Father Mirren's backstory. Having said that, Dominion serves equally well as a prequel to the godfather of all horror movies and as an indie nightmare. Director Paul Schrader's vision is noteworthy as he constantly brings more life and realism with each passing scene. However, it would have been nice to see more of the demon that would eventually possess Reagan McNeil. The film is very polite and mostly fails to haunt the viewers in the way the original did. But a few scenes, like cattle devouring the corpse of hyenas, or the one with mutilated bodies of two British soldiers, raise the tension. It is in these scenes that the viewer realizes Schrader's abstract yet simple idea of evil. Liam Neeson was supposed to play Father Marin, but the veteran, Stellan Skarsgård, did exceptionally well, and we have no reason to complain. <laughs> Demons, 1985. A mysterious man invites a group of strangers to a movie screening in a remote and newly renovated theater. The movie that's being played is an extremely violent horror flick, that revolves around a group of young boys trying to dig the grave of a 16th century fortune teller named Nostradamus. Not before long, the events of the film start happening in reality, and one of the moviegoers turns into a demon and has the power of infecting others. When they attempt to escape, they find that the only exit has been blocked. Will the trapped men and women survive? Director Lamberto Brava made this film with a delicate mix of Italian flamboyance and pronounced horror, topped with a layer of gore and mystery. The film has an unusual setting alongside murders that never let you get bored. The only flaw is probably the over-the-top gore in Carnage, because, after a point in time, the viewers feel numb towards them, and the horror element takes a back seat while nausea rears its ugly head. Apart from that, Demon sticks to the core substance of possession, and Brava's cinematic style makes up for other flaws. Noroi, 2005. The film revolves around a paranormal researcher named Masafumi Kobayashi who was known for producing various documentaries and books about paranormal activities all around Japan. The film follows a semi-documentary style of filming, and we are shown Kobayashi's latest documentary named The Curse. He was investigating a woman named Junko Ishii after neighbors constantly heard the sounds of crying babies coming from her house. As the investigation proceeds, Many people start disappearing, dying mysteriously, while others commit suicide. A local historian named Tanimura tells Kobayashi that many years ago, the locals of the village summoned a demon named Kagutaba, but later imprisoned it. They performed a yearly ritual to keep the demon trapped, but in 1978, the village was cleared to build a dam, and a priest and his daughter performed the final ritual. The girl went insane after the rite, and was presumed to have been possessed by Kagutaba. Later, Kobayashi finds out that Junko Ishii was that little girl, having now grown up to be a nurse who helped in illegal abortions to steal the fetuses. Will Kobayashi be able to deal with this horrid knowledge he has gained? Or has his fate been sealed? 
We insist that you hunt and watch this haunting Japanese film. If you are a lover of horror films or even a general movie buff, Co-writer and director Koji Shirashi's expertise has ensured that the film looks like a condensed version of a horror show, like The X-Files or Supernatural. For the two unsettling hours that the narrative runs, it constantly packs several stories of demons and curses while keeping the atmosphere tense and grim. Noroi maintains a seemingly slow pace, but it effectively builds the plot to give the viewer a truly horrific and thrilling experience. Noroi is clearly one of the best documentary style and found footage horror films that came out of Japan in the first decade of the 21st century. Do give it a watch if you already haven't and let us know your thoughts. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.